stage of the Tour de France, the second mountain stage and no less than six mountain climbs. There were no attacks as the race went over the first climbs of the day. They included the Col du Porte d'Aspe, where the riders stopped for a minute silence early on the stage on Tuesday morning at the spot where the young Italian rider Fabio Casatelli was killed in a fall in 1995. And his family were also present. The race then headed off at a slow pace over the Col de Port. Things started happening on the very long Col de Porte Don Valera. World number one Laurent Jalabert made the first move in what would be a memorable last 60 kilometers. Look at the way Jalabert is riding along here. Luca has done an incredible effort to get across. We will see now how fresh really um, uh, Reese is because with his acceleration, if Reese is still hanging on the back, I wouldn't hold it too much hope for him because um, it's a bad place to be at the back of the group when the guy accelerated because if a group, if a group kind of breaks in two because of an acceleration, because of one rider or another, as we can see here, these two riders here after getting dropped, yeah, um, it's a bad place to be. Yeah, Matt has been dropped now and also the TVM rider, it's uh, Rooks have just been shelled out too, and you can see how Maros is really struggling. This this uh, long, steady climb is really knocking the stuffing out of these riders. A uh, 20 mile climb, and it's having its effect. Johank now is coming to the front as well and reacting a little bit. As you see, uh, Luca just going out the back door there. This is making it very difficult, but I think they have that. Um, Johank is going a little bit early, unless he has seen and sensed that that Reese was in difficulty. Well, Reese has moved up. I think he's realised that the jumping around is probably destroying his uh, constant rhythm and he wants to be a bit closer to the front and keep an eye on affairs. He's got the ability to come back on the descent anyway, but uh, the question still is, who's going to get the biggie? The prize of uh, 20,000 French francs, 10,000 per second at the Souvenir Only de Grange at the top of this climb. 20 miles of climbing, all the constant effort, not a single bit of false flat, nowhere to let up, nothing to take the edge off the climb. It is still up, 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 up all the way. This is the hard part now that this last uh, two or three kilometers. Well, it's been hard until now, but it's hard because the speed has been up. Whereas now we're getting into the small, the smaller roads, the more twisty roads. So it'll be interesting to see now if uh, Vianney is going to have a go, or if maybe Laurent Diffo is going to have a go, as the one year of the t of the Fresnina team uh, said to me this morning. But I still believe that Reese is a little bit too far back to be, to be, to to to, to, to kind of signal. I think it's a signal maybe. I think because if Reese was feeling good, he would be up a little bit closer to the front because. The way these boys are accelerating now, if there's a split in the group, he's going to find himself behind and have to use more energy to actually close the gap. So I feel myself, Dave, that I don't want to kind of talk too soon, but I feel that uh, race today is not on a great day. Well, it didn't give us the number of Bogart on the run down, or I must have missed that one, because Bogart has come onto the front now, the, the Dutch champion. Just imagine that, a Dutchman riding up a big mountain like this uh, and towing the rest of the field behind. We're having a, a look on our cameras at this great ski resort here, and one minute, ten seconds back to the yellow jersey uh, no, no doubt about it with ski resorts they're not the most architecturally beautiful uh, piece of, uh, of work you like to see us back here uh, Reece Dave Reece is getting some food from the car they, I'm really sure Reese is getting the hunger lock Dave well we shall see and in fact uh, Bernard Hino did say in uh, one of the articles I think he wrote in the uh, which magazine was it probably the one published by Anne McQuaid the, 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 the official journal of the, the Tour de France that in fact uh, he said you have to eat well today you have to eat constantly you can't allow yourself to, to get into what we call the position of the hunger knock. And I think Reese has suddenly realised that perhaps he hasn't been eating enough and may now do something about it. So there we are, the ski resort in the background. It's, certainly when the skiers come out there, when it's covered in snow, it probably looks like a fairy tale scene and very nice indeed. But uh, they aren't, pretty, they're, well, I was going to say, they're ugly buildings in the summer. I certainly don't think they've got too much to commend them. Well, the reason I feel Reese is having a problem with, with, with hunger is because he didn't ask for a bottle. When he got off the, 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 actual, the team, was a, a small little packet which is a drink actually, a very sugar, very sweet drink, which goes straight to the system, which gives you a little bit extra, which kind of can help you get over uh, a, a kind of a, a lull in, uh, in, in your form. But unfortunately, if you take it too late, it'll not be, I don't think it'll be a time for the final climb. But also, Reece, the reason I think he's not right as well is because taking a bottle or taking anything else from a team car on a climb, he, um, he's putting his leading step wide open for a time penalty and also a financial penalty. So I think if Reese had been in good condition, he wouldn't have done it because... Uh, 
we know, we know someone close, close beside us here lost to Tour de France for eight seconds. So yes. I can't see him taking any risk on that end. And so it looks like Jufa at the moment taking Veronk up towards the top of the climb here at the Port uh, de Anvalira. And uh, are they going to persist with this? As just behind them then, some of the top climbers are beginning to move up on the wheels. The gaps are opening up then still. Have they gone too soon to get this special prize on the climb? Festina still dumb, and the gaps have opened up suddenly. I can't see Reese here. It's um, only Ulrich there. Only Ulrich. Ulrich is there. Casa Grande is there. Jimenez is hanging on. Scarted in the green. He's just uh, back at the trying to hang on likewise. And correct, I think Pantani uh, has also been distanced, but perhaps he's waiting for the final big climb of the day. Not taking interest in this special prize. Who's it going to go to now? And Reese is being dropped off the back. Reese is struggling here. He doesn't look too good at all. Reese then just behind Bogart and up it. There's Jan as well, beginning to uh, wish he hadn't gone quite so soon, looking down at his bike, thinking, where am I going to get my extra energy from? And so there is Livingston climbing up for the cup of his team, the American out of the saddle, but the gaps have opened up now. Who's the next one we're going to see? And it's Escartin. And I think Pantani is just trying to come across that gap. Certainly Hino, in the uh, 97 Le Tour de France official guide, it said here that uh, by Hino, he says, some forget to eat, and they're taken up with the race too much as Pantani comes up now. They've forgotten to eat. It's already too late. They're raging hunger. Their legs won't work. And this is what Hino said in that uh, magazine, Stephen. It's right in front of us. And look at what was happening to Reese. He ought to have read that. Well, the program on the site, published by Anne McQuaid, McQuaid published the official Tour de France guide, has an incredible amount of interesting things in it. It's on sale all over Britain at the moment, I believe. So if someone wants us going to find out what's going to happen before it happens, I can't I advise to go out and buy it. I couldn't believe that, that what Hino wrote. And there it is. And the man who's suffering is last year's winner. Bjorn Rees is in trouble, but uh, he may still come back. You never know. Well, I say to make it on, to make it back on, on the right over is. the top. But looking at him here, I doubt if he'd recover before the, the final climb. There's so still two more climbs come, Dave, and they're much more difficult than these, in the sense that they're very, very steep. Also, your ankle will have seen uh, this happen as well, and he'll be making sure to try to put more time into him. And he is coming back, though. He's driving himself hard to get up there. They're looking back to see what has happened to Reese, and he's now back on that little group after stopping for that uh, uh, energy uh, booster. And they're all now together. Well, not all, but about uh, 10 of that uh, group of 24. Still some way to go for the big, big prize of the day. <laughs> Jalaba taking a drink of uh, Pascal Lino as they go through. And we were talking about the write-up in that official Tour de France guide. I've actually got the version in French here. They put some different pictures on the front, but the wordage is exactly the same inside at this particular point. That's the official French version, which I've got with the compliment of Nike they gave it to me. This selection of riders here now is like the creme de la creme there. These boys here, we're going to see them going over the final. You have like Pantani, uh, Ulrich, uh, Virenk, uh, Laurent Defoe, Casagrande, uh, Escartin, uh, and Rhys, of course, just got onto the back of them again. I think that the, the, the winner is here, of course. It's easy to say <laughs> everyone else has been left behind. But we're going to see some incredible fighting, I think, now over these next two climbs. The two climbs that have come are much different to these climbs. They're very steep. They're very sharp corners on them, so if you're not on form this today, if you're not in there at all at this moment, there's no way you're going to be in there later on. Well, out of the top 15 riders in the Tour de France, we've got in this little group, Jan Ulrich, who's lying second uh, overall. We've got Bjorn Rees, who's lying fourth overall. Richard Veronk, who's lying fifth. Escartin, lying sixth. Dufo, lying eighth on, gen on the general classification, as at now. And Marco Pantani uh, in this group uh, is up in 15th spot. Just think about Pantani. He was 62nd yesterday, 7 minutes and 17 seconds down. He's got up in this group now and uh, Donald Jalabert should be getting back. He was 17th this morning. Looks like he might regret it just before we get up towards the top of the climb. And yes, he's made it with Bogart. 
He's made it back on, but I think what's happened now is that um, the Heinkamp, the foe, have eased off a little bit. They've realised that they are strong, but there's no point in bringing Ulrich either to the finish. So I'd say what might happen now on the next climb is you'll have uh, Diffo and the Heinkamp having to go 1-2, one, one, trying to get rid of Ulrich, because if they bring Ulrich to the finish every day on the climbs, Ulrich is going to put two minutes, two minutes per time trial into these boys, so there are two time trials to come. So I think that the Heinkamp and uh, Diffo would need like some three minutes in hand before going into the last time trial to say that to, to kind of count themselves as being uh, uh, free of anybody coming up from behind. So otherwise they're riding for second and third place on GC. You've just seen Alano desperately hanging on uh, to his teammate here. One minute, 35 seconds down on this group here at the top of the climb, getting closer and closer to the uh, the line for the special prize. But 135 is the gap and his teammate have been doing a remarkable job and interesting enough, the yellow jersey is still hanging on in that group at 135, but he could lose it today. He was only 13 seconds up on Jan Ulrich at the start of the day. Uh, Bjorn Rees at 143, Veronk at 143, uh, Escartin 214 down, so the yellow jersey could still stay in the top half dozen, but he could lose it today, but he, even that could blow apart at the seams when we start to, to do the big final climb of the day. Quick look there at uh, the other rider from the Mercatone Uno squad uh, that's uh, really been in uh, with a shout P P Pantani, who's been looking good all the way through. It looks like he's put a crash out on now to, uh, to surprise us. Let's have another look down there. And I think they're coming back, uh, Bogart and uh, Jalabur. The group are reforming. They're still probably about a couple of kilometres to the top of this climb, but uh, the damage is being done. Reese has now found his way back up, and he's sitting on the back of his little pack after going through what seemed to be a bit of a bad patch. But he's recovered, and he's up with the leaders. Back to the Tour de France with... Licha Pilsner. just uh, gone back for some reason uh, to the back of this pack. We didn't quite see what it was but he's taken up his position remarkably easy. The rest have been groveling to hang on to the speed. Ulrich just drifted back uh, down. I think he went to speak to his team car and he's just drifted straight back up again as if he's out on a club run. Absolutely amazing. Inside the final kilometre to the top of the climb of the Port uh, de Envelera and uh, that 20,000 uh, French francs is still there up for grabs for the first man. Still Dufo doing the work. Verong looking remarkably smooth. But the way that uh, Ulrich came up to that group, I don't know whether he went back to get some instructions for his team car, but he drift, drifted back, came up again. When we see other riders struggling to stay in contention, Ulrich made it look so easy. Well, Ulrich is the best man here uh, for the overall classification. He's given, he's proven last year that he is a tour potential winner. He was riding last year for Bjorn Rees uh, and still he rode if a fabulous time trial the second last day, putting some two minutes into Bjorn Rees who had the yellow jersey on his back. Uh, so this year, I think it'd be no surprise if he is in there, but Phil Hank and Diffo will be, uh, will be aware of his, of his uh, capabilities in a time trial and he'll not be too keen to bring him to the finish. Well, looks like Kevin Livingston, the American for the Coptic team, has got back as well into this little group. Nice to see him up there. The American, uh, very good riding by, his, by uh, his standards, just on the back of this little group at the moment. Certainly in that Casa Grande in the red, the right hand side of your screen. Dufour on the front of the man, Veronk there, both of them riding for Festino. Bolts in the white jersey with the uh, red, black, and yellow bands round the back. Jimin is just behind in the white jersey with the red and yellow on it for uh, the uh, Rabobank team. In the uh, blue and yellow, we've got uh, Zaberg and Pan Tani for the Mercatan Uno team. Uh, Luttenberger in white and orange for the Rabobank squad. Uh, still over the line. Uh, it goes one and two to the Festina team. They then get 30,000 uh, French francs. What a tremendously strong performance. It was, uh, but very important even still. As uh, Reyes just kind of threw his head coming over the, the just as, as the lines went over the fence over the, the, the line on the, uh, at the mountains. So Reyes just cannot be in a good way at the moment, Dave. He seems to be just kind of hanging in, hanging in, hanging in. And then he just threw the head. So um, it's not looking very good for the next two climbs. There, Jimenez dropping down behind the leading uh, four or five riders. About 11 riders in that group. Uh, Jalaber suddenly found himself going out the back door when they accelerated to get that special prize. Looking down, Pascal Lino 
coming up with the rider that comes in in the red colour on the right hand side. I think Lino. Lino's looking for a, either a drink or a, something to shove down his shirt. Uh, there's Conti just at the back of that little group at the moment. Uh, Shanta just going through as well for Casino. Casino actually are doing some useful, useful riding, aren't they? They've been there or thereabouts all day today. Very interesting how this, if I use the word lowly team, uh, but nevertheless they're prepared to get in, aren't they? They have a man here, a man there, a man somewhere else. Well, last year, if you remember, they got a wild card. They got an invitation, special invitation to ride a Tour de France. They only had a very small team. They put in a great performance, and with that great performance, they got a, uh, a, a, another sponsor, meaning you got the, the casino of all around France to come in. Here we see the yellow jersey of Vassar and Orlano. They're, what are they there? They've 136 so far. They're going to be some two minutes down going over the top here. But um, the casino team then got a bigger sponsor then through the winter, which allowed them to take on bigger riders and better riders. They took on Pascal Richard, for example. But unfortunately, Pascal Richard, who is the Olympic champion, had some misfortune this year and had a very bad crash before the Tour of Romandy and was out of the Tour of Italy and subsequently out of the Tour de France. They've had, they had some great luck this year. The other day they had uh, Caspussis doing a great um, breakaway, winning the Comotivity Award. We saw Caspussis away in the front earlier on there. Like There's a great group of riders in this, in this team who actually have a go at any time of the day on any kind of terrain. Well, they have survived the course. Uh, Chanteur uh, getting up over the top of that one and uh, is now hoping to recover and come down and join up as is uh, Laurent Jalabert. We're watching Jalabert come down here past a green jersey winner, what, three times in the Tour de France when he was prepared to go for the sprints. He backed off the sprinting after a while when he kept uh, being brought down by the crashes, but perhaps now he might uh, have second thoughts when we get onto somewhat flatter stages because he hasn't quite got the punch to come out in the, the top uh, half dozen of the Tour de France of this year round. Just getting a bit of news here over the race radio. They're saying that uh, Bjorn Reese is stretching himself now on the bike, stretching his uh, his calves and stretching his thigh muscles. So I think what's happened to Reese is he's probably gone into a little bit of a hunger knock, and um, he's just hoping now that taking the, the bit of food he's taken on board a few minutes ago, that it will um, um, help him get over the next two hills. But um, I'm sure that we see here Lauren Jalabert here getting back onto the back of the group. But I'm sure that Fiona and Gandifo have seen here an ideal opportunity to put Reese behind him because Reese is another guy we know is very good at time trialling and he will also take another two minutes per time trial out of the likes of Irang. So there's still, there's still the Alps to come, of course, after the Pyrenees, but um, uh, I'd say that Irang and Defo, feeling the, the form they have at the moment, I think they will be giving it everything they have now to go for another stage win and to put as much time as they can into the likes of uh, Orlando, who is already behind, and um, and Reese, who seems to be in some difficulty at the moment. Well, Jalabert trying to get back now and catch up with the uh, the leaders over the top of the climb. Oh, there's a big crash, crash at the back. I've heard on the phones now there's been a crash at the back. Yeah, it's a back in the back row. They didn't say whether it was in the group of Orlando or in a group behind him, but I, I'm just hearing coming across my lids here that it's... Uh, there are 14 riders in that leading group now and the crash occurred in the second group at the back of it, back end of it. There's now actually 14 rather, there are two, four, six of I counted 14 now. And two minutes at 10 seconds is the latest time check coming up at the moment. Let's go over the result of that climb then. So Bogart and Jalabert have both got back to the leading group at the moment. And over the climb, confirmation then that uh, Veronque was first for the Festina team. Second was Dufo. Third, Casa Grande. In fourth spot, Ulrich. Fifth spot, Jimenez. Sixth, Pantani. And seventh was Conti at the top of the fourth, uh, first category climb at 199 kilometres. We're watching Yeah, they're just running down the, the tail enders going over the top of Lino and Camazend and so on. And in fact, we're looking now at uh, Chanteur, and I think that is uh, probably Camazend just over in the front of him. 
and they're all trying to regroup on this climb. The interesting thing, unless they get back on this one, Stephen, no sooner as they get down here at, uh, what, uh, 214 kilometres, they've got about 15 kilometres straight down, and suddenly, no sooner as they get the bottom, then it's out off the big ring and straight back on the inside ring for the climb up the, uh, the Col d'Oino. What does that do to the legs? Absolutely explodes them, Dave, because they've been... They've you, you were searching for a root word that wasn't rude, wasn't it? I was trying to put a word out in English. <laughs> you <laughs> can uh, speak French or, 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 Lat or Italian if you wanted, you said. But it's, um, no, it was uh, after going up this very long climb of 35 kilometres, then going down this very fast descent, it's uh, very, very fast. But all of a sudden you hit a wall at the end. You hit a, vo hit, hit a wall at the end as you start going up again. As we hear, Jalabert now has actually gone off the front again, Dave. So Jalabert is really determined to get away today. I think he's realised that he is not going as well as the front guys, so the best thing to do is try and get a bit of uh, bit of space, put a bit of space between himself and the likes of your Hank, so that um, he has some sliding space, as you might call it, on the final climbs. Well, he's got just 10 kilometres of climb up from Canillo to uh, the Col d'Ordino, uh, and that one is a second category climb before we then drop down the other side and repeat the dose all over again. It really is a bit like a roll a coaster ride in these final uh, 50 kilometres or so, up, down, up, down, up, down. Well, the problem is now, the riders will have seen, the Hank and uh, uh, Ulrich and they would have seen that Jellibert is not going that well at the moment on the climb, so the fact that he's gone away and caught them by surprise, they would be saying to themselves now, well, who's going to ride? Ulrich would say, well, I'm not going to ride. Uh, the Hank would be saying, I'm not going to ride either. So this is giving, uh, this is giving Jellibert the opportunity now of getting the maximum amount of time into the, putting a maximum amount of time into the group behind him, I just see his very aerodynamic uh, style here. Whether it's, epic, whether it's effective or not, I don't really know. I thought he'd make it a rude signal to the people he's left behind for a minute. But it's a very, very fast ascent here. As you can see, the road is very, very wide, so uh, it's very difficult for a group behind to actually gain a lot of a lot of ground on him. I just see he's on a black bike here with the look name on. He's been riding a sort of yellowish coloured bike before. I presume they've both gone on some very much lightweight carbon fibre and extreme light bikes for the climbs today. I haven't noticed that one before the tees on. No, you're right, Dave. Normally, the, all the bikes of the Onza team are always all the same colour, yellow or pink, depending on whether in the Tour of Italy or in Tour de France. But um, uh, normally, whether it be carbon or composite, or whether it be uh, titanium or aluminium or steel, normally all the bikes are always the same colour. 12 seconds, Jalabé, but look at this. Brochard, who won the stage yesterday, who got to uh, puncture at the bottom of the climb, is now struggling back here, and he's over eight minutes down, so he's uh, lost a lot of time today. He was 10th on general classification at 4 minutes and 4 seconds. I think all you have to do now is ride for that polka dot jersey, but the gap at uh, the start of today on the jersey had 110 points to start the day ahead of Vronk with 100... Uh, sorry, uh, yes, Vronk had 100 points and he had 110, so I think somehow that Vronk could take the polka dot jersey off uh, Brochard. There's Pascal Hervey in there as well with uh, with Laurent Brochard. Pascal Hervey and, uh, and, and Brochard, two of the heroes of yesterday's stage. And I saw Breukink as well. He survived with this one. So he's putting quite a useful ride, isn't he, for a man who's supposed to retire from things like the Tour de France. Well, he actually had basically retired before coming into the Tour. But, of course, um, Johan Brunel, one of the riders from the Ramabon team, was injured and could not make it. So he's called in the last minute to, to ride the Tour. So he's very relaxed in the Tour all right this year. But the Tour de France is so demanding now. You can just see him down here. You might get to just see uh, Jalabert getting down the bottom of this hill and going straight into the final climb. Oof. They're going down here at some 50 miles an hour, these riders. Absolutely mind-blowing, isn't it? I'd say close to even 55 miles an hour, Dave, I'd say. They'll be going out, I'd say, almost 100 kilometres an hour. The, the gear they're pedaling there is 53.11, Dave, so you can see the way they're pedaling. They are going very fast. As you see the yellow jersey here um, struggling, not struggling, but he's uh, uh, limiting as well on the front group. Stephen, surely with three Benestos here, including Alano, who started this morning uh, out on general classification in third spot, that's helping the yellow jersey. The Benestos have got to work, and he's very sensible sitting on their train, isn't he? Well, the other riders know that um, if, uh, if the yellow jersey is having difficulty on the other climbs in the final climb it's even more difficult and know also that in the time trial uh, Vassar will be way behind or on anyway
Jalabert is doing what he does best of all. These lone breaks or going with a small group, it strikes me always with Jalabert that uh, when he's confident, when he's comfortable, I don't look upon him as a winner of the Tour de France, but he's quite capable of, of doing something exceptional. He is a very brilliantly talented rider who's consistent to me, but isn't quite right at the very uh, top, is he? But, and this is exactly what he should be doing, looking for an opportunity of trying to go away. And once he gets a bit between his teeth, he's usually psychologically able to lift himself. He is, but I think at the moment he's actually frustrated with himself because normally by this stage in the tour he'll have won a tour or won a stage or he'll have, he'll have done something exceptional. Whereas for the moment all he's done is followed the wheels and uh, he had one chance he had up in Plymouth back in Plymouth like back in the second or third day. He had a chance of winning the stage. He was there. Everyone thought he was going to just pounce on the pedals and ride away and win the sprint. But what did he do? He didn't do, didn't do anything. He hadn't got the legs. Then we thought in the mountains he was going to do something and he didn't do it. So I think at the moment he's kind of got his backside between two chairs at the moment. He's going to say, well, I can't win the sprints. In the mountains, I'm limited, so I'll try and do it somewhere else. So he's, um, this is what he's doing at the moment. I like that backside between two, sir. I've never heard that before. Did you make it up or you heard it somewhere else? <laughs> That's a nice little term. Well, this little group don't seem to be too bothered at the moment. They're obviously... As Lucas come back and he's going straight past this little lot now, right up to the front. Kamazin's come back as well. And uh, it looks like they're regrouping and it could be not long before Olano and the yellow jersey also come back to this pack. Yes, but even if it do happen to get back onto this group, Dave, once they hit this final, this second, it isn't even the final hill, the second last hill, because there's still two climbs to come. Here we have the Vassar now relaying with Orlando, a very nice kind of kind of fair play uh, sight to see on our screens here, Dave. And US Postal staying still in there at the moment. That's uh, rather interesting that they're prepared to get stuck in. That's uh, Jean Cyril Robin, who's quite useful in the, in the mountains, and he's there with this group. And they really are riding themselves out flat out. Their legs are actually flying around here, aren't they? They are, Dave, and anybody that knows anything about cycling here is uh, 53 11 is a very, very big big year. With 35 seconds now, Jalabert back to the, the group of the of the Hank and Ulrich show. The fact that they're actually easing off a bit now, this group here might get back on again. But unfortunately, they had to, they, they, but they'll have to think about not giving it everything on this descent here because when they get to the bottom, I keep repeating myself, but when they get to the bottom of the descent, there's a very small roundabout where they cut across the roundabout and straight into this like a, a stone wall. So they give it everything they have going down. They will not have recuperated sufficiently enough to, um, to, be, able to, go, to be able to sustain the, 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 the attacks which I'm sure are going to come on the foot of the final. Hill. Well, has Jalabert uh, burned himself out on the descent? Will he have the strength to, to climb that next climb? Because he's not the last one either, because once they've gone up that uh, climb, when he hits uh, Canelo at the bottom, you'll see it come up on the, your screens, I'm sure, the little name of the town. They then turn, it's 1,550 metres above sea level, uh, Canelo. Uh, at the top of the Col Dordino is 1,990 metres, so he's got 440 metres of uh, climbing. That's about uh, 1,000. 1,500 feet and all of that in a short sharp uh, 10 kilometers of climbing and then down the other side so it really is uh, a roller coaster ride for these chaps but there's no free tickets being given out this is not Blackpool no kiss me quick hats no rides on the donkeys this is the Tour de France Luca now has gotten that gun look at the, the teamwork he's doing he was dropped on the final hill after doing an incredible amount of work going up the other hill now he's getting back in here again now he came straight to the front didn't take time to recuperate and here he is drooling down this here now. What he's doing here now actually is he's trying to keep maintain the gap between themselves and the group uh, Orlano. So with Jalabert up in front and the three riders from Festina bringing down this group, they know they've distanced the yellow jersey, they know they've put out the back door uh, Olano. The race heading down to the bottom of this uh, drop off the port uh, in Valera. They'll then hit the bottom and go up for the next climb. We're going to take a short break. Sit on your seats. More action coming up. Back to the Tour de France with Astra, the satellite system. What a race we've got on our hands today as the uh, yellow jersey group you can see at the bottom right hand side of your screen 35 seconds down the top of the climb have come down like an absolute sort of verbal off the shovel to try and catch up with the uh, what was 11 men originally now about 14 men uh, chasing out this man uh, Laurent Jalabert so Jalabert in the lead right now then a group containing uh, uh, Ulrich and uh, Veronk together with uh, Dufo and Loka of the 
West Cena team, but they're losing a bit of ground now on the furious chase of the yellow jersey group, which is being led by the Benestos, and they might well come together before we set on this uh, penultimate climb, uh, which really, I think, uh, will start to sort things out. Oh, that's our major group. Just telling you about the change in gear, Dave. Yes. And yeah. look at them coming up two behind. It looks like the, the, the uh, yellow jersey group's back on, Stephen. Yeah, looks to the... the, the it looks like they're back on, and they've hit the hill. <laughs> yeah. So how are they going to come across? No, it's gone again, look. Yeah. What will happen now, Dave, is they will just accelerate again, and the strongest will, will survive. But the boys that have gone down the descent like, like crazy men, they will not have recovered sufficient enough to hold on. The road now, you see it goes around here, Dave, it'll go around the corner here, and back on itself again, it'll go round and round and round all the way up, with the top of the climb getting very, very steeper. So Jalabert on the way up that climb, you can look down there and see the rest of the field strung out now. Something like about 35 riders could be coming together as yes, he's just done that. He's looked back down there. At least now what he's doing now is he's gaining some sliding room or sliding space as we call it because yeah, and what will happen is that, that, that the riders behind, like the, like the, the teammates of uh, behind will be making it very, very hard for Ulrich and for uh, and for Reese. So the main kind of attack will be done down the bottom and they will catch up. Here's the group splitting again. You see that the, the, that the group of Arlano and the, and the Vassar, the yellow jersey, were just got back on and straight away it snapped again because they hadn't got a time to recover before uh, Defo here accelerated again. There's Reese Scott in front, Dave. Reese is just here on the right hand side of the screen. Is that early? The casino riders come across there because he wasn't in yep. that group originally. Is, Dave, he must right, have come up right. from the back group, got onto this one, and he survived. He did, yeah. We see the sign here for eight kilometers to the finish. And this is a very, very hard climb, but it's still not the hardest climb, Dave. As I see um, uh, young C. Francois Simon here getting dropped, but the climb here is very difficult. But then they go down into the town again, and they go a sharp right up another 10 kilometer, very, very hard climb. So today is by no means over. There's still an awful lot of fighting to be done. I will see Vassar here now riding on the front with Abraham Orlano on his wheel. I'm sure himself must be feeling very, very proud because himself being a normally known climber having a next world champion and a potential true winner on his wheel you're watching it live on Eurosport this afternoon the struggles, the, each man fighting his own personal battle against fatigue, against his legs seizing. And now Alano trying to go across here. And that's interesting. We've also got uh, Daiwa here from the La Mutual de Sene Man. We never thought they'd last very much, that team. But at least one man is doing what he can to go with this group. Every man here riding against himself, controlling and trying to just hold on, hang on, look up there. You can see Cedric Vasso now. Who would have thought that this man would be in yellow? at this stage of the Tour de France. Certainly his father would not have thought it, but right now he's again doing the ride of his life as Reese moves to the front. Wonder Dave is really just kind of bluffing here. I mean, in my opinion, it's very, very easy. He recovered very, very fast. I can't see on my colour my screen. Is this yellow bear they're pulling back? Yeah, he's only some 50 metres ahead of the group. But, but uh, Reese now is actually um, coming to the front. It totally surprises me, Dave. You think he's bluffing or just... Uh you know, well, he maybe coming back again because he had that food, didn't he? Like Kino said in the uh, in that article in the special. Oh, what's happened now? It... 
he slowed right down. I saw him fiddling with his uh, Velcro straps about uh, 10 kilometres ago. I wonder if he's having trouble with his, his, his cleats or his Velcro straps on his shoes, or in the heat. What happens with these, these shoes, Stephen? Because I mean, in the old days when you had leather shoes, leather soles, leather tops with holes, and you could pour water on and you could soften them as such. But these shoes with their very hard plastic soles, uh, their, their, their nylon mesh tops them, and this Velcro, do your feet smell inside? Do you get any pain? Well, not, they have all these orthopedic uh, special soles now, which they put on their shoes. So normally that shouldn't be a problem, but I've seen him myself a few times putting his hand down to his left foot. So maybe there's something wrong. What we see here, Ulrich and Rees here at the front. Are the two of them just kind of using this as a tactic to actually kind of slow down the group and say, OK, lads, we're here, you know? But uh, maybe they're not actually feeling as good as they're, they're making out to be. After all, Ulrich now is, is actually leader on the road now that uh, uh, Vassar is behind them again. I said Ulrich was a green yellow, yellow jersey, but he's 13 seconds only uh, behind um, uh, Vassar. Vassar's only like some 20 metres behind, so he's not yet yellow jersey. Well, there they are, the regathering together of both the group. It looks like yellow jersey might be getting on any moment now. And here he is climbing up uh, with one of the Festina riders, and they've been doing a wonderful job again today. And this is uh, Johan Luca, who's been really driving hard. And uh, this big group is reforming at the front, and off the front goes. Uh, is that Robo? No, it isn't. The Mutual Saint is Joa, isn't it? Dojo. Do Dojo. How do you he's pronounce it? D Dojo. D he's, he's made a great. Oh, run. look at the sh state that uh, Jalabert is in. Yeah, he's, uh, he's blown completely. But um, Vassar is doing a great ride here. But the fact that Vassar is getting back on here with no disrespect to the effort he's doing, I think it's because, it's because the front group is actually slowing down. They have Dojo going off the front here. So uh, Dojo, you may not remember him, but about three years ago, he had a great Tour de France. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he was gone. He had a lot of um, injuries and medical problems, what have you, and he was gone. And he's come back again this year to the, the Saint-Amar team. The Saint-Amar team where a... a um, it's Bernanke going, Dave. Dave, uh, it's Bernanke, I think, is it? Behind with uh, Ulrich yes, on his wheel. he's rocking, that's him. Or the Diffo. Diffo has gone with Kazagrand, Ulrich, and behind on the wheel. And Pant Pant Pantani then is bringing up uh, the group. Uh. This is changing as we comment on one... Uh, particularly part of the action. Suddenly, so we thought when Jalabert rocketed off that perhaps he was going to get away from the group while they were looking at each other. But look at this, this the, on his face. This is a man in trouble, and he's fighting his own personal battle. One day they're going to put that that fork. <laughs> It'll make his eyes water. <laughs> No, but Jalabert is very strange though, Dave, because he has the same problem in two of the classics this year. I think it was the Tour de Flanders and in Liège, Pastel Liège. He was very prominent for a long time during the events. Then all of a sudden, they finally got a hunger knock or got weak and just couldn't go any further. The very same thing has happened to him today. The hike is going, Dave, with Ulrich on his wheel. Reed is having difficulty at the moment, David. We have Kazakhstan there, but Reed is back there and one, two, four, sixth place back. We have Bjarne Reed, sir. I think the best thing is the Steelers have actually recognised that Reese is actually bluffing earlier on and he may be able to get rid of him. So the next few kilometres now of this hill is going to be very, very important. We saw in the background the Danish flag. I know that uh, Eurosport in English is listened to by a large number of uh, Danish people there. Welcome to Eurosport if you've stuck with us during the day. Thanks for your company up there in Denmark. And I'm sure you'll be saddened as much as we are to see the Grand Champion struggling on this particular occasion. But it's all not over yet. This is only stage 10 of the Tour de France. And we've got to go right on until Sunday week in the Champs-Élysées. And people go through bad patches, have bad days, and come good uh, towards the end. And 
Lewis is still sat in that little group. He's fighting his own personal battle against fatigue or whatever it might be that's uh, not helping him on his way through. And Vassar here, again, fighting his own personal battle to, to try and keep that yellow jersey on his shoulder. Just 13 slender seconds separating him from uh, Jan Ulrich of uh, the German telecom team, who looks so comfortable at the moment. But, Stephen, in the Tour of Switzerland, I saw Ulrich confident in the early part of the race. He took a stage so easy you thought he was going to coast the Tour, and in, in the next day or day afterwards, he was struggling up the climb, and Reese went to him, looked at him, and just rode straight away from him, and Angloletto, who I would say is not normally in the class of, of Ulrich, could stay with him. So, you know, although you can have good days, you can certainly have bad ones too, can't you? Well, the idea in the Tour de France, or the, 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 the best thing in the Tour de France, is not to have any really bad days, or the bad day you do have, you kind of wish to have it on a flat day so you don't lose too much time. But having a bad day on a, on a day like this can be deadly. You can lose an awful lot of time. But the race is a long way from over yet. There's still the, the still this climb to finish off. There's still one more very hard climb up to the finish. And then, of course, we still have the Alps to come, Dave. So even if someone loses a bit of time today, it's not totally over for them. Uh, 12 seconds then for this man on the front. Uh, Jean-Philippe uh, Doua comes from Elbeuf, uh, a rider who we say had is his third participation in the Tour de France. Seven times he's been a professional. Seven years he's a professional. He came through RMO, Festina, Gann and Akai. He was fifth in the championship with France in 1992, second in the Tour de l'Avenir in 1992. He won the Tour of Luxembourg uh, way back uh, in, what, 1990, uh, 92, and the Tour of the Côte de Picardie. So he had an early start to his career in 1992, and uh, remember, he was that one of the best-placed French... If he played 15th, uh, the best-placed French rider in 1993 in the Tour de France, that year he was also uh, fourth in the uh, Dauphin Libéré, and the following year he's 10th in... Uh, 1994 when he's riding for the uh, uh, the gun team. So he's had a bad patch, he's come back good now, and a lot of riders won't recognise this about it, how good he has been in the past, Stephen. Well, he had a bit of trouble, unfortunately, over the last two years, and he hasn't been at his best. He actually was actually inconsistent in any race. Nobody ever even saw him even, you know. But um, it's great to see him coming back again now, because it's nice to see a rider like this, the style he has in the mountains, because that's where his, his, uh, his strong point is, in the mountains. So it's great to see him out here today on in my opinion the hardest stage in the mountains in the Tour de France and um, being off the front with only some 20 kilometres to go well he was third in the World Amateur Championship way back in 1990 and here he is now doing a great ride some seven years later with a name like D-O-J-W-A uh, Joshua would that be of, of uh, probably a Pol Polish background do you think Stephen I I'm not very familiar it with sounds, the French name sounds like it alright it's not an Irish name I wouldn't say it's, <laughs> it's a French not an Irish name either no, it isn't Macdo uh. <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, it's difficult to know, but I say it could be something like a, a Czech or a Polish name, all right. right. By the Mercaton Uno riders of uh, Zeberg and Pantani. The uh, yellow jersey has some 20 seconds behind this little group there, which contains Bjorn Reese, who's happily sitting in on the wheels at the moment. But our leader out in front is the man from the uh, Saint Amour 12. Very strange day because uh, Fionn Hank and uh, Diffo have just disappeared from the top 10 riders, Dave. I wonder how something happened to them. That nothing has come across on the radio as yet, but um, they've been very, very strong all through. And now all of a sudden you have the. Uh, Berg in the front of Pontani. We see Reese in there, we see Ulrich in there, and we don't see uh, Festi any of the Festinas there at all. Nice picture in the background there of a bicycle made out of goodness knows what. It's certainly not ice cream cones because they've melted in the sun now. 25 seconds then between Daiwa and it's the first people, group. Oh, it's people! That is something I've never seen before on the Tour de France, Stephen. Isn't that marvellous? Let's Come on, all you people back home in Great Britain, wave to them. Come on, let's wave. They're waving. We're, oh, they're off now. <laughs> the saddle's broken. <laughs> the bike is falling apart, Dave. Huh? Oh, that happens to me too. <laughs> I'm sure some of those riders in the climb are falling apart as well. But I'm um, oh. just a little bit wondered, a little, little bit concerned now as to where the Festina riders have gone to. Uh, knowing the two riders and, and with uh, Diffo and uh, and Vianang, I would hardly think they, they did, did too much too early. But there they are now. You're sitting there on the screens. I'm happy to see them back there again. But um, I'm a little surprised they've gone. So so far back, like they're to stay side by side, but um, I wouldn't have, have kind of imagined to have them suffer, 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 back, suffer back at this time. I just saw on the corner of a screen that we saw uh, Orlando. 
They've seen the ones there, 131, uh, 121. Uh, they are the team leaders. That's uh, 121 is Luttenberger at the moment. 131 is uh, Ellie from the uh, Casino Squad. We briefly saw the rider from uh, the... But Esso squad is coming up now, Alano again with one on his back. All the number of ones are given to the, the, the team leaders, the people they think would uh, finish best of all in the uh, Tour de France. Isn't 51 the lucky number, is that, or 52? Which is the lucky number? 51 is the one that the likes of Hino and Coutil, a number of riders have won. And actually, when I won the Tour in 87, I had number 21, and Delgado had 51. So when Delgado got, over, got the jersey off me and out the way, people thought, well, he has number 51, he has the yellow jersey, but all the mouths to come, well... He has to win it again. So, uh, but unfortunately, well, fortunately for myself, um, I was going to change things that year. And number 21 won Tour in 87. Well, this man here has got 98 on his back because nobody expected him to be wearing yellow and being so far up at the front of uh, the race so far. He sold it on magnificently, and you can see ahead the grandeur of the Pyrenees. This part of the Pyrenees, by the way, is much more rolling uh, mountain. I noticed last night when we drove over from the, the finish, uh, we went from Ludenville over the top of the mountains, across some unmade roads, or at least they've been dug to death by the Spanish equivalent of the Irish navvies. They've been out there relaying the roads Stephen. I tell you, you like rallying. We came down this climb with zigzag bends all the way down. They, they cut up most of the road. They'd taken the surface off the top, and it was just like riding, uh, driving down a, a rally stage covered with that. So the, we're now in the Pyrenees, the more moulded parts of the mountains, not the craggy stuff we saw the other day. And this man here is riding really, to me, I love to see, by the way, Stephen, people like this who come back, third in the amateur championship, 1997 years ago, has his problems, comes back, and suddenly catches a few people. He looks very comfortable indeed, and I have to take my hat off to him because I said when they put in La Mutuelle de Saint-Aimane in the Tour de France, the Tour de France was taking a risk, putting in a small team from the second division, but this man is giving us something to really uh, say well done to the team, eh? Well, he is, Dave, because I remember even you know, only yesterday or the day before yesterday speaking to a certain commentator who had a, a, a Saint-Aimane portfolio, and he was saying, well, I might not, might not as well have gotten this folder because the Saint-Aimane haven't done anything. So there you are, Dave. <laughs> I stuck it in my bag here. Oh, it was you, Dave. It was me, it was me. <laughs> and I've actually passed the information up to our French commentators here because they hadn't got this uh, folder with you. I picked it up in the press room because uh, La Seine Mutuel, I have to admit, Stephen, because they're not in the, the top 30. I didn't write to them to ask for information on their team at the early part this year. Fortunately, they put it in the press room and now I've been handing the papers backwards and forwards and here we are. This man is going well. I knew of Gordon Fraser, of course, because uh, he rode with the... Uh, the, 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 the the uh, Motorola team, but he's out of the race. At last uh, yesterday, he was outside the time limit. But that young man in the front, I remember when he was 15th in the Tour de France in Revelation. But he was the only one I knew by name out of the whole of the team, apart from, of course, from uh, from Gordon Fraser. Well, actually, Dojo remembers my, me as well from that Tour de France because he was actually lying 13th the morning at the last time trial and uh, I beat him by something like two or three seconds. So I finished 13th overall on the Tour. Somebody else finished 14th at two seconds, I think it was. And Dojo finished 15th at something like five seconds to myself. So he remembers me as well. <laughs> he doesn't look like the ideal time trial is by his build, though. He's sort of uh, very thin legs and he's actual from his knees down. What what's these big mountain climbers, uh, these specialist chaps, they're quite small. They have enormous thigh muscles and very thin scraggy uh, legs from the knees downwards with with very little muscle there but it, it's I think it must be the, the thighs and the tops of the knees that push the uh, the, the pedals round and they have uh, chest you know like a, like a marathon runner and spinny little arms that they, they, they especially produce these uh, these uh, mountain climbers we're looking at one now here Pantani who's taking his hat off now to get a bit of a suntan on his, his shaven head but certainly today if he stays here I put him down to be number one at the end of the stage today that is a kiss of death but I keep my fingers crossed for him. Uh, they're stringing along now. Still one man in the lead at the moment from the La Mutuelle de saint Emar, which is Jean-Philippe uh, Doua. And they might well catch him before we start the final climb of the day. Oh, 
on this uh, tenth stage of the Tour de France, 252 kilometres. That's a massive uh, 155 uh, miles. Still a brave effort by this man in the yellow jersey to stay in contention with the people. Let me give you a quick rundown on the overall classification and what we've had in the way of results so far today. We set off this morning with uh, Vasa. We just saw him on our screens in yellow jersey by 13 seconds from Jan Ulrich of the telecom team. Uh, in third spot, Abram Elano has been fighting his way back into leading groups uh, over the last, uh, uh, what, hour or so. He was 114 this morning on the yellow jersey. So the yellow jersey now is at 35 seconds on the, the main group, and uh, we've now got one man some 12 seconds, uh, no, more than that, uh, I think about 30 seconds down the road in front. But nevertheless, he looks like he could well lose his jersey today, but what a gallant fight he's put up to be in there battling with Alano, who's fought his way back in the leading group. In fourth spot this morning was Bjorn Rees of Denmark, the telecom rider, at 1 minute 43 seconds. Uh, 1 minute... Uh, 30 seconds, going up towards the top of this climb on the Col de no for our leader here, 224 kilometres covered at the top of this climb, and at the end they've got 252 to cover, so he's got a bit of a way to go to win this stage today. Then running down the general classification, watch this man concentrating on trying to get the uh, the mountain uh, uh, climb at the top here. Veronk is fifth, 143. Escartin from the Calme Castablanc uh, Eurosport team is in sixth spot at 2 minutes and 14 seconds. Oscar Camazine from Map the Swiss rider is in seventh spot at two minutes and 27 seconds. From the Festina squad, the eighth place man is Lolof uh, Dufo as he goes over the top of the climb now, having covered so far in the race 224 kilometres and has just some 30 or 28 kilometres to go to the end of the race. And who will be there in the top 10 spots? Because behind Dufo in eighth is Nardello, the Italian to the Mape squad, 3.49. Lolof Brochard in 10th spot is certainly going to lose that one. He was four minutes and four seconds down this morning, the Festina rider from France is now way back in the group the last time check we had he was well over 8 minutes down, it's going to be another day when the general classification is going to be shuffled and a big change is coming and at the moment the yellow jersey, Massa is certainly going to lose that, but the question is who will take the yellow jersey will it be Ulrich, who saw that this morning 13 seconds behind him, will it be uh, uh, Veronk, who was 143 and therefore 1 minute 29 seconds behind Ulrich we just saw the, uh, the Grand Prix of the Mountain there, Dave, and we saw behind just going forward, and uh, I think that Pontani actually pipped him on the line, so that might uh, that might um, uh, upset behind because he doesn't really like anybody doing it to him. But of course, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you do well. I think wrong has got to get every point now in the King of the Mountains because uh, they were looking after Broshard, who punctured on the big long climb up towards the top of the Port uh, d'Ambalava, and. Uh, on that occasion, uh, certainly Brochard would have been there, but I think now, they saw that this morning, Brochard and Verunk with just 10 points separating them. Ulrich was back in third spot with 66 points, not really contesting the King of the Mountain, so now Verunk could be going in the polka dot jersey, so no wonder he was trying to get the extra point. He wouldn't like Pantani beating him, not so much because just Pantani beat him, but because he wanted the points for the, uh, the King of the Mountain's competition. But the big thing is, if, if Verunk plays his cards right and uh, can stay up there and, and knock a minute and a half out of uh, of, of Ulrich on the final climb which is possible for a great climber he could take yellow as well or do you think Ulrich's so strong? Well at the moment looking at Ulrich I think he hasn't shown any signs at all of, uh, of getting any weaker and he seems to be able to match Virenk pedal for pedal so um, I just wonder now like uh, you know um, Vasser is more than likely going to use, lose a jersey today Ulrich is going to put on his back and that's what the drastic happens in the final I wonder will Ulrich have a go or will he be afraid and say that if I have a go I'll blow completely out of the, out of the, the, whole, out the whole show um, Bjorn Rees who does not seem to be in great form uh, today seemed to have had a problem with a, with a hunger knock earlier on there so is, Ulrich is in a situation at the moment I think where he's very undecided what he, what he should or should not do but uh, I would love to see Ulrich attack him because so far we've seen him defending he defends so well so calm and so calculated I think it would be great to see and having a go. Bjorn now is calling his uh, call the team car. Or oh, Duffo, is it? Sorry, Duffo. Duffo is calling his team car for a bottle, probably.
think that's uh, Pascal Lino there, is it? David, you can see on our screen and now just kind of stretching his legs. It's just uh, kind of relaxing them a little bit on the, the centre before they hit the final climb. Well, I've just got confirmation of the time gap at the top of the climb of the Col d'Ordino, and it was 1 minute 35 seconds back to the yellow jersey, and the man who went over first to spot was uh, Doywa of the La Mutuelle de saint Aymar. He was followed over by uh, the battle for the uh, second spot on the line, and it went uh, to Pantani. You're quite right, Pantani, uh, uh, Stephen, got past Ferronc, so Pantani was second, Ferronc was third. Uh, behind them, it was Ulrich in fourth spot. Uh, Casa Grande was fifth, Gemini was sixth, and the rest coming just shortly after that. So 135 back to the yellow jersey, who no doubt on the gap on the on the drop down here will close that gap. But he really is putting up a magnificent fight, and he can go to bed tonight, uh, Steve. I'm sure confident that he gave his all, not only yesterday to keep the yellow jersey by 13 seconds, but he did not miss a beat today. To think we could see him riding with Olano with such guts and determination, who would have thought at the start of the Tour de France? Well, I say we'll get back on again. As you see, the team cars here coming past them. It'll hinder them on some places, but it'll actually help them on other places. The reason the team cars are coming through is because when we get down the bottom of this hill, we go to the, to the town of Andorra, and we turn sharp right up this uh, final hill. So if the cars don't go past now, it'll be very difficult for them to get past um, on the final climb. So this will help us, sir, um, get back on. But I think, though, he's make, using a lot of energy here to get back on on the descent. So when he does eventually reach Oh, it goes very wide there. And it does eventually get back on to the group at the end of the hill. He'll be starting the final climb straight away and may not have enough time to recuperate. But even still, he's putting in a great, courageous ride here today. And still, Ali then, Jaiwa heads the pack. Is our leader then still going strong at the front? Daiwa. It's a very, very fast ascent. There. You can yes. see here the corners are very switched back. On this end stage, uh, Lucian uh, to Andorra Arcalis. The leader has a lead of uh, 50 seconds, and Kamazin's hand's gone up. I think he might have punctured. He's fought his way back to that leading group. Uh, he was struggling on the other side of both the big climbs. He's come back on the descents right now, but his hand's gone up. In fact, he can't have punctured the way he's throwing his bike about. Surely, Steve, he'd be on his ear if that was so. Yes, I'm sure he's possibly going back to get a bottle, but um, he's taken a risk because this group now is getting very, very long. You can see the front of it here. It's already 100 yards ahead of him so he's taking a risk of, 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 a, of the group splitting on the on the set him getting left behind but um if he's very thirsty he, you know, he must do it but he's this group now is 50 seconds back on uh, dojo and the yellow jersey is back is back 130 back which is about 40 seconds back from from ulrich We've just heard coming over our uh, microphone, over our earphones at the moment, that the commissaire has just um, told the director sportives that they can actually feed the riders until 10 kilometres to the finish, which means that they should not. There's no reason for them to actually get get, get uh, being a push at the moment to get the bottle. Because what I was forgetting about Dave was that normally the um, the feed stops at 20k to go. So I suppose um, uh, Camazine is supposed to be going back thinking, well, I'm 20k to go now. I better get a bottle now because I'll not get it later on. So the commissaire has actually lengthened, actually shortened the, uh, the time and said, OK, you can get it now because of the danger in the descent and because of the, the, hard, the hardness of the stage today, we'll authorise feeding up to 10 kilometres to go. That has been the problem, Steve. Ever since you went uh, over the top of the climb after 200 kilometres, straight down the drop 14 kilometres, straight up 10 kilometres, straight down 10 kilometres, and then the final 20 kilometres, up and down and up and down. And uh, so the team cars had great difficulty 
Tivoli coming to him. There's confirmation then of uh, Dayot Pantani and Varank, which I read out uh, for you. The interesting thing, though, when you say now they've, they've changed the rule, you, you can go in the last 10 kilometres, it's a 20-kilometre climb with the team cars coming up on the steady grind up towards the top. As we look then at the confirmation that uh, Brosha has lost his uh, Kingdom of his journey to uh, Jersey to Varank, there's no way he can get it back because he certainly won't get back up for the final climb of the day, which is a old category climb. Won't the cars be slightly in the way and the fumes belching out and trying to come through at a time when the riders are settling for that climb? Well, the riders that are, that, are, that are in front won't actually be hindered by it at all. So I think the, the, the idea will, is that the, it's only, I think the last climb actually is only about 10 kilometres up to the finish. But from the bottom of this climb to the foot of the next climb, there's about a kilometre or two of flat. So it's, it's actually on our, on our map here, Dave. It actually goes up. It's actually more of a false flat and wide roads. So I'd say they're, they're actually doing is authorising the, the feed to the foot of the final climb. And the foot of the final climb, what, I'm, what I mean is, we can see we come into the the town here, the road opens for a bit, it got a false flat up for a little bit, then you have your very sharp turn right up a very small road. So I say that's about roughly about 10 kilometers to the finish, and they have authorized the feeding until then. Well, he's now some 50 seconds clear of the group you see on your screen, that first group which contains most of the top men searching for honours in this Tour de France. Let me give you a rundown whilst they're going down this hill on what is mounting. What's happened since we started out on stage 10 of the Tour de France from Luchon to Andorra Acales, 252 uh, kilometres. That's 155 uh, miles indeed. The first of the sprints today at uh, Fronsac, uh, was taken by Zabel. Zabel ahead of Gouverneau, and that was just after 18 kilometres. We then went up the uh, Col uh, des uh, Ars, and that particular climb after 27 kilometres at uh, the, the, the Col des Ars was won by Brochard. Varank was second, Pascal Harbour in third spot. It really was just a ceremonial sprint and a ceremonial where they went across because the bunch were all together. The reason was that as we went towards the uh, Col de Porte d'Aspect, it became clear for all to see, because we went through after 45 kilometres, the monument to Fabio Casatelli, the, the uh, Olympic champion from 1992, uh, uh, who unfortunately had a serious accident and died when he thumped into a concrete uh, post in the Tour de France in 1994, and all the riders uh, came together and slowed down at that point, before we went up the Col de Porte d'Aspe, when at the top again, Brochard took it for Varong. A sprint at a shell went to Zab from Fonichari, and by the time we entered the Col de Port, the race had started to warm up, but still Brochard went over in first place, ahead of Varonk. Then over the uh, Port d'Avalar, another big climb, Varonk and Dufaud really started to split the... Absolutely tremendous performance by Cedric Vasser of the GAN team. The man in the yellow jersey is fighting his way back to the group here. Although Daiwa is down the road, having gone at the lone break and established a leader nearly one minute on most of the favourites. Look at him coming back now. He really is riding himself absolutely superbly. He's controlling his effort. He's had to fight his way back all the way through since he got dropped on the big climb uh, up towards the souvenir on the de Grange on the Porta de Amber and here he comes back then in towards that group. What a tremendous fight. But we're going to come up shortly towards a big climb towards the finish of the stage today. This stage 10 of the Tour de France from Luchon to Andorra Arcalis. If he gets back on again, they will all raise the roof and cheer him. But somehow I think once they start to explode on the way up the final climb, he'll be grovelling yet again. But this man who yesterday triumphed, he rode himself into the ground to still hold that yellow jersey by a slender 13 seconds on Ulrich. He's now coming back to the main people who'd like to take it off him. It's been a wonderful performance. A man who came to this race just as a domestic to support the efforts of the GAN team. Moncassin in the sprints, or Bourbon in overall honours, and he's now back on the uh, main pack. Well, that is absolutely superb. We're joined here in the commentary point uh, by uh, Pat McQuaid. We're going to have a quick chat to him as this man is out the lead, Pat, before the whole thing blows apart the scene. You've been a past commentator for Irish television on the Tour de France when uh, 
Uh, Stephen Roach alongside me and, and Sean Kelly were riding. And now as the president of the Irish Federation, you're very much involved in taking the Tour de France into Dublin next year. First of all, how do you think the Irish public are going to take to this sport descending on their own doorstep in Dublin? Oh, I've no doubts that the Irish public will warm the Tour de France greatly and they'll give it a ter terrific reception. I mean, they've had the Nissan Classic, they've had the world's best pros over in Ireland before and uh, they always gave them a warm reception. They know a lot about the Tour de France, follow it closely and I've no doubt it'll be one of the biggest events ever to take place in Ireland. What sort of support are you getting from local industry, government and everything else to set it up? Because Ireland, whilst it's a big country, you are a small population, aren't you, uh, Pat? And you've got to co get cooperation with many, many people. What sort of support are you getting? We're getting absolutely magnificent support right from the very top down, from the highest levels of government right down to local government and even small towns and villages, the local committees of small towns, right throughout the whole uh, spectrum of local authority and support and administration, we're getting the support we need. And what, whatever is required by the Tour de France when it comes to Ireland next year will be delivered and will be delivered, you know, more than tenfold. Uh, Pat, I believe you had certain people out from uh, Ireland coming out on the Tour de France. What, what's what you're trying to do with these people coming out? Yeah, we've, we've uh, had an exercise on this year's Tour de France, a very important exercise in relation to next, the Tour de France in Ireland next year, where every couple of days we had a group of visiting local authority personnel and police personnel. And these are the people who will be actively involved in uh, organising and ensuring that the facilities and the, the structure required by the Tour de France will be in place for the Tour de France when it comes to Ireland. And really, as you well know, this, this, this thing is such a big event and such a massive event that to sit across the table with people at local authority level and try and explain to them what is required, they just don't really believe it. But now every one of them has gone home saying now they understand what we've been talking about, they understand what is required, and they have guaranteed that they will do it. Uh, Stephen, you got a question? I mean, well, you're, you're, you're deputy director, aren't you? Well, you can ask questions as well. What you, won't about, get, um, you won't get fired. They need you. What, what about the Irish roads and everything else? From being here on the tour this year, we've seen a lot of crashes and everything else on smaller roads. Um, has there been a certain amount of concern by the officials you've brought over in the, to the tour this year about the Irish roads? Will they be able to hold up to a, a peloton of some 200 riders plus all the personnel, the following cars and press cars and everything else? Yes, I've no, I've no, no doubts they will. Um, I mean, as, as, you're, as you rightly say, in the first week of the tour there was a lot of problem with crashes, a lot of problem with small roads and that is by and large because the tour was using small and the infrastructure of small roads as such because as you well explained on television last week yourself, uh, July is holiday time in France and they're forced off the main roads but in actual fact the roads we are using in Ireland for the most part are quite big new roads, I mean as you well know yourself Stephen uh, the, the whole road network in Ireland has improved dramatically over the past 10 or 15 years and we're using quite big roads, albeit that the, the roads on, on the Wicklow stage now will be mountain roads as such and naturally of small enough but the, the the road for instance down on the first half of that stage a very very wide road down as far as Arklow on the east coast and likewise on the stage the following day the road from Dungarvan right across to Yall and into Cork is a massive big wide road so I, I would have no fears on that score. Ireland has four cars this year and the cavalcade it going ahead of the bunch every day what is the reaction from the French public or the people on the side of the road to having um, the Tour de France in Ireland next year and the, the brochures that have been distributed by these cars? The reaction has been absolutely tremendous. I mean, there's a great warmth in, in, in France for Ireland, there's no doubt about it, and that's coming through from the public on the roadside. I mean, the, as, as you say, the, the caravan cars are going ahead and giving out brochures, telling people about Ireland, giving them Minitel numbers and, and helpline phone numbers in order that they can make contact with the Irish tourist authorities and make their way to Ireland. And uh, then we're coming along in these cars later on in the, the advanced press group, and they're seeing Ireland again, and we're getting comments like, news alone, news alone, we are going. I've had people come up to me and they're so I come up to me in cafes at lunch and so forth and say, can we have some details about going to Ireland? We're going to make a holiday out of it and we're looking forward very much to doing it. So I've no doubt that there will be a huge influx of people from Europe, France in particular, over to Ireland, not just for the three days of the Tour de France in Ireland, but for a week in advance or even a week or so afterwards. So I think it's going to be a tremendous occasion. Uh, Pat, just one there about the travelling backers and forwards. Uh, presumably you're, you're, you're sort of explaining how to get there because they've got two stretches of the water to go. I mean, some people fly, but getting the entourage the Tour de France with so many vehicles across the channel into England and across over to Ireland must be a monumental job. Are you involved in that or just getting people back out of Ireland into France? Well, we were involved in it in that um, the, the whole operation has been done by Stena, uh, Stena Lines from Cork over to Roscoff, but also Stena Line will be bringing in the, the, the advanced vehicles in advance of the race. Now, they come in the previous week at their leisure, so they, they can come in on, on many of the Stena Line boats that are travelling through 
through both the, from France to England and then from England or Wales across to Ireland. But then the big operation is from Cork to Roscoff when three massive big ships will be transporting the 1,500 vehicles from Cork to Roscoff overnight. And when I say 1,500 vehicles, if you put them end to end, bumpers touching, you're looking at four and a half kilometres of traffic. Massive. Now then, Pat, earlier on before uh, we... Uh, are we going to have a short break uh, coming up now in 10 seconds? But I'd just like to have one more little chat with you after this, this uh, break we've got coming up on one particular point. In fact, it's still what we call a Q point. We'll wait for this and uh, then we'll start again. The Tour de France with Lika Pilsner. Well, I've got with me uh, Pat McQuaid, who is head of the organising body in the Tour de France for uh, uh, Dublin, and it looks like an attack has gone off on the yellow That's jersey here. There. He's got uh, about 12 kilometres to go, he's fought his way back, and suddenly he said, look, I'm going to go down with all guns firing. This is phenomenal. This is what makes the ordinary public say this cycle racing game is something unique, and off he goes down the road. Absolutely tremendously, he's fought his way back. We all thought he was grovelling on his knees, and as soon as they got the climb, he'd be blasted out because in about three kilometres from now it really gets uh, tough but he's doing a great ride Steve isn't he? This is something called Panache Dave and it's a Panache you don't drink it's something you actually very only certain kind of rider has this kind of uh, capacity to be able to do this kind of a ride he's been fighting his way back on all day he's gotten back on on three or four occasions he's gotten dropped on three or four more occasions now he's gotten back onto the group he took a couple of kilometres to recover and now he's attacked again he's caught them all by surprise there's still this very big climb to come and I'm sure there's going to be fireworks but here we, we see it again now on our screens the attack of Vassar this is an incredible ride for Vassar today now Pat just a couple of final questions you've been on the tour in the past looking as a commentator with when Stephen and, and Sean Kelly were riding what do you think of the tour this year and how would we build excitement out there in Ireland oh well, I think it's a tremendous tour and it's developing into a tremendous tour I think it was unfortunate the amount of crashes in the first week that knocked some of the favourites out but we're getting some fantastic racing going into these mountains yesterday and today and I think it all goes well for the next week I think it's going to be it's anybody's race really it's a very very open race now earlier on uh, today when I started coming to half past nine I was looking at a program that was sent to me by somebody uh, out I think he lives in Wicklow of 1953 in the Antostal race uh, there, which I rode against your father in those days many years ago and Shay Elliott was also riding I remember that very well indeed in fact we have a, po a picture I've got going through in Scorthy where the stage is starting this year and from those days on after Seamus Elliott uh, we've seen uh, uh, riders going over uh, to race on the continent, the most successful, of course, being Sean Kelly and uh, Stephen Roach. How is Irish cycling? You are the president now of the Irish Cycling Federation. Do you see uh, the, the tour getting more lads interested? Have you got a young talent coming through? What can we look for in the future? Well, the tour is a very, very important element in the whole thing that you're saying. It is true we had a great time during the 80s when, when uh, Kelly and Roach were at the top, and then the, obviously after their retirement, there was a lull. That lull is now, we're hoping that the Tour de France is going to be the catalyst to a new group emerging. In the, in the later 90s and oh, into wish, the year 2000. We wish the better luck, Pat McQuaid. Thanks much indeed. We may speak to you before the end of the Tour de France. I'm sure a lot more people who may have missed today's programme would like to hear what you've got to say. Do join us again sometime. You're very welcome, Pat. Thanks okay. much indeed. Thank you, and I think you've got a wonderful finish to accommodate on here now coming up. It looks like it, doesn't it? I'm Leave it alone then, Pat. <laughs> it's with bated breath. We're looking for this one too. Thanks, Pat McQuaid, then. And uh, I, I should, if I say the Irish cycling mafia, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but the family McQuaid, have uh, got a great uh, uh, tradition in cycling over the years, I say, since I raced against Pat's dad. Even this magazine, which has been published, the official guide to the Tour de France, comes from the McQuaid organisation as well. And is that Camazine going yeah, off the front? Camazine going off the front. That's my, that's my headphones are pulling out there, Dave. I'm trying to get the microphone on knitted here, knit from Pearl 2, put three together. I think you need to be a crochet expert to undo the cables we've got here. I shall put it on one side of it. It's getting worse as time goes it's on. It's very interesting, Dave, to see what's going to happen here. Here you have a situation where you have your Hanks saying, OK, it's, uh, it's up to um, Ulrich to ride or, or, or Reese to ride. And Reese and Ulrich are saying, well, it's up to your Hank to ride. They're obviously afraid. Ulrich and Reese are obviously afraid of your Hank for this final climb, which is very, very steep, and vice versa. So with um, uh, Vassar in the front, uh, Dave, he might even hold his jersey again today because at the moment he's actually not only 13 seconds ahead of Ulrich, but he's adding on to it again. 
This is something absolutely out the top drawer of cycle racing, which you're watching live on Eurosport. Uh, Joga, who launched that attack on the uh, penultimate climb of the day of the climb of Canelo, and it caught a lot of people napping. They didn't realise what talent this young man had got, although despite the fact that way back in 1990 he was third in the World Amateur Championship, went on to have a tremendously successful Tour de France in 93 when he finished 15th overall. He's come back in this race and caught a few people napping and a nice stepping stone. I don't know if the yellow jersey can get up to him, but my goodness, uh, what a response we have from the yellow jersey to attack on this final climb of the day. 252 kilometres from Luchon to Andorra, Arcalis, and the worst or the best is yet to come. Well, Vassar is under some pressure here, but like it's neither here nor there. He's done an incredible day. He knows, like on the final climb, he's going to suffer even more. He knows the journey is almost gone. So he says, "I'm going to go down. But if I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down shooting." So um, he's uh, what well, he's got about some 35 seconds behind Dojo at the moment. Normally he won't catch him because Dojo being a better climber. But in the meantime, everybody back behind him are still looking at each other. And in the meantime, this guy here, Cedric Vassar, is moving away from them. And another rider here at 10 kilometres to go is off on his own. I missed that in all the chat that was going. I did actually see him out the corner of my eye slide away. So there's a lot of activity with stepping stones up in front, which are going to make it quite interesting for Vassa, who is suddenly beginning to struggle. He's pouring water all over himself to try and cool down. Is this a sign of a man in desperation straits, or is he just trying to find uh, some way of cooling down I in these hot attack. conditions? Uh, Ulrich, Dave. Ulrich attacking. Race 25 to Kamenzin, according to the calls coming over on the race radio. This group is at 1 minute and 40 seconds. This group you're looking at now, 1 minute 40 seconds on Doyo. That's the first time we've seen Ulrich attacking, Dave. I wonder is it because Reese has said, OK, Ulrich, I'm not feeling the best today, have a go. But the strange thing about it was that he caught out uh, Virenk, and it, was not, it wasn't Virenk that went after him first of all. So I wonder is Virenk even having a good day today? Well, anything's going to happen in this uh, most amazing tour. We've lost the grand champion, Indrain, who tried to control things for so often, and lots of other people are having a go now. It's still all up for grabs on this stage 10. Ulrich is making a, he's making an awful effort here, here at the moment now to go after Vassar, whereas Vassar is not his real direct rival because he knows that Vassar they will get him in the Alps if, he, if they don't get him before. But Casagran on his wheel, Diffo, Bjarne Rees behind him again. So uh, this is very interesting tactics here. But I, I think the, um, this is going to split this group again, Dave. So Ulrich on the front starting to drive this one forward now. We've not seen a lot of him attacking of Rank on the far side. Realise he's got to do something about this. If but behind Dave is pulling out the line, he's actually getting dropped, Dave. He's getting dropped. And Ulrich starting to put the pressure on him. Veronica has got to respond now. Rob then is starting to come now and trying to come up to Ulrich. He recognised now that uh, they're closing up on the three riders up in front as the yellow jersey who started today just 13 seconds up on Ulrich now looks back to see Ulrich come up on his own. We could be watching a man taking the yellow jersey and he was starting in this race then having yeah, been his second in the Tour de France last year and he had to be in the wheel and in the shadow of uh, Reese to start the Tour this time, but Veronk is coming back at him now. Veronk this morning started in fifth spot, one minute 43 seconds down on the yellow jersey, and Ulrich was one minute and 30 ahead of him, and Ulrich is now dropping Veronk. Yeah, David, actually it was a diff for us uh, pulling out of line a few minutes ago, but look at look at, look at uh, Ulrich at the moment, his hands down the bottom of the bars, this reminds me of Indiran. Indiran used to do this all the time on the climbs. Veronk now is, is gone now, Ulrich is on his own, Dave. I think it's about nine kilometers to go to the top of the climb according to what's coming in on my headphones as Varank now starts to try and pull the man back. He may have spent too much energy yesterday dancing around and trying to get to points of the kingdom man. And Pantani comes back. This is the man I picked to be the winner today. I didn't put Ulrich down, but I thought Pantani might do it. And nine kilometers to go, Pantani's got that ability to zap up to the top. And he's coming up now. And he's coming up to uh, Varank, but ahead of him still lies uh, Ulrich and still rise uh, the... Uh, 
One man out in front, Dogger, who's got an extremely good lead on everybody else at the moment. Pontani now is, uh, is helping behind get back on again. And, you know, he unwillingly is helping get back on. But um, Pontani is very capable of going, going along and, and getting back Ulrich if he's on his normal form. So far, the Tour this year, since yesterday in the hills anyway, Pontani has, been, has not been shown the signs of his old, um, his old self. But at the same time, uh, as the climbs get on, he gets more and more into it and he can do more and more damage. That is fairly typical of Pantani, though, Stephen. Do you remember in the Tour of Italy, must have been uh, three or four years ago when he first turned pro, he waited until the two mountain climbs on a Saturday and Sunday right at the back end of the Tour of Italy and surprised everybody by taking both stages, not by a sniff. He just romped away and destroyed the field, didn't he? He does, but just hope here now that Ulrich has not gone too early because the climb gets very, very steep still again. It's still a hard part to come, so um, I just hope that Ulrich has not gone too early because if your line can get back on to him if it, that's to be the case so. well yesterday Brochard finished in first spot at 14 seconds was Richard Veronk at 14 seconds lightweight Pantani and Jan Ulrich they came in and really fighting an enormous battle to stay in contention Vassal came in 20th spot 2 minutes 57 seconds down he preserved his yellow jersey by 13 seconds but today it looks like it's going but he went down with all guns blazing but yesterday Veronk was second Pantani third and Ulrich in fourth spot. It's changing now as Doiva, who's been away uh, since we started the climb at uh, Canilo. Uh, he's now about to be reeled in and he's had his moment of glory out there. He's ridden extremely strongly and very well indeed for the team La Mutuelle de Seine, Eman. He certainly waved the flag for the boys in blue and white. And Ulrich comes up to him now. Look at the speed he goes past him, Dave. They're very, very, very impressive. Now we're only in the Pyrenees, Dave. There's still some 10, ten days left. There's still the Alps to come. Early uh, is putting some 1 minute 25 the now, the yellow jersey. At 1 minute 15 seconds is a group containing Alalo. Alano. The call's coming in on our radio. This man is really destroying the field. Can Pantani get up to him? Or is Ulrich now going to dominate the race? Here comes Pantani towing up Veronk. This is suiting Veronk down to the ground. But Veronk never rides with anybody. That's what gets me, Dave. He never rides with anybody. He sits on the wheel. You mean he should come back with Pantani and help him? He should come. should help Pantani, but he, he probably find uh, Veronk attacking Pantani towards the top. <laughs> Rather than riding with him? Yeah. Unbelievable. Now, you can just see that satellite so spoke to you about the pirate himself has got uh, his special little saddle with the pirate on it. Well, will the pirate plunder the star on us today? They can see Ulrich in the distance. Dojo, oh, no, Dojo, Dojo. Sorry, no, George, we're coming back. So they're now riding in to second and third places. Pantani, who started uh, the stage yesterday, lying back in 62nd spot at 7 minutes and 17 seconds. And you now watch Ulrich, uh, sorry, watch uh, Reese, who is beginning to struggle. He doesn't look too happy indeed. He's concentrating hard to try and stay in the top half dozen and maybe use his time trialing skills uh, to go forward. Don't forget that uh, Ulrich, on that uh, last time trial stage in the Tour de France last year, won that one and really uh, set the seal on a superb uh, Tour de France by then moving up to the second place overall. Well, Reese is actually at the top in the group that he was uh, that he was with, so he still has, his option is still open to finish on the podium. Although the way Ulrich is riding here at the moment, it's gonna gonna can almost someone take someone on a motorbike to catch him actually. But Reese is still fighting in the back. He doesn't seem to have the little he had a bit of zap he had of him last year, but um, still he's uh, all is not lost yet. He can still finish not too far behind Ulrich. 25 seconds back to Pantani and uh, Veronk coming over the headphones now. 20 seconds, uh, sorry, 25 seconds back to these two riders. We haven't seen Vassa yet, Dave. I wonder if Vassa has been caught. He must have been caught and blown. Yes, he has. He's, won, he's at 125. Uh, he's been caught. 125. Well, Rich doesn't even get out of the saddle, Dave. This is one of the hardest parts of the climb. Oh, there he is. Sorry. <laughs> you heard me too. You heard me talking, but um, he just so impressive the way he sits back on his saddle and powers away. But has he gone too soon? Pantani left it uh, very late to come through. He's back there with Veronk, 25 seconds behind Ulrich, who's now riding into the yellow jersey. Know that about it, with the yellow jersey now, 1 minute 25 seconds back, he's going to lose the jersey. Olano is also back 
uh, in that group at about 125. Bjorn Rees has been dropped by Ulrich. So Ulrich is riding into the yellow jersey at the moment. Richard Baronk this morning started one minute 30 seconds down on Ulrich. Either he catches him, he will not take the yellow jersey. He'll go to the young German, this tremendously talented man who has been passed amateur champion of the world. He's now showing in the world's greatest bike race that last year's second place was no fluke. But don't forget, this is only stage 10 of the 1997 Tour de France, and it's a long way to go to the Champs-Élysées on Sunday week. There's some six kilometres left to go. I just hear the uh, Walter Gutterford being interviewed now on French television. Walter Gutterford is driving the team car behind Ulrich at the moment, and he's saying, OK, we, we told him to have a go. We didn't realise he was going to be uh, made the gap so quick, but um, once he got the gap, we told him if he got a gap, to keep it, so not, not to look back. He's doing it at the moment, but we just hope that he doesn't does not run out of steam before the finish, because climbs can be very, very deceiving. There is Yellow Jersey slogging his way up the mountain. He's now about one and a half minutes back on the lead. Up. Full sight of the yellow jersey going off the shoulders of Vassa, who yesterday really rode himself into oblivion to finish just uh, 30 seconds ahead of Jan Ulrich, who's now looking like he's going to take that to jersey off Cedric Vassa. But Vassa surprised everybody. He's had that jersey on his shoulders now for, what, some six days. Who would have thought that when he went to the Tour de France? Who would have thought that Ulrich would have taken the yellow jersey off him on day 10, as it now looks likely? And who would have thought that already uh, Bjorn Rees would have been struggling to stay with his uh, young protege here from the telecom squad the German champion then wearing that uh, champion's jersey of Germany could get all change and become yellow by the end of the stage today but it really zigzags up a bit Stephen this is a conking climb and it gets worse doesn't it it goes further on up and these two specialist mountain climbers might still come back at him because it's still holding at 25 seconds it is but look at Ulrich he isn't yet 24 years of age he has an incredible future ahead of him as we have here Arlano here uh, struggling also behind. Lauren Defoe was there also, Reese is there. So Alano has uh, got back to Reese, that's significant. Uh, Alano has been struggling to save that leading pack, he's yo-yoed off and Reese ha had been in the fa in the past with uh, Alano but now and uh, they've gone ahead of Alano, now they've caught him back as well and the, they've got some five kilometres to go, inside five kilometres. See the face on Laurent Defoe there, he's struggling a lot. But Arlano, Arlano seems to be doing this. He hasn't got a little bit extra to go with the first guys. What he does now behind, and he tries to limit the 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 um, the, 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 the loss behind. There you have the comparison between the last year's winner here, Bjorn Rees, on the right-hand side of your screen, and Jan Rulrich on the left-hand side of your screen, last year's second-place rider, after working an awful lot for Rees last year, and again this year, there he is now on the front of the tour, the virtual yellow jersey. The gap back between Ulrich and the chasers, uh, Veronk and Pantani, is 35 seconds. He's certainly riding into yellow jersey. Can he also get the stage victory on this very, very tough day? 252 kilometres, 155 miles from Luchon to Andorra, uh, Arcalis. They started the first half of the race in a rather moderate style. They didn't race to begin with. They went past uh, the monument to Fabio Casatelli, who uh, died in 1992 as a result of a serious accident going off the top of that climb of the uh, Col de Port de Aspa. They pay their respects then, they started racing, and uh, now, since we've gone to that halfway point, it's been all systems go. And right now you can see that uh, Pantani and Baranc are somehow... Look at Baranc there, I'll cut you off here again. Baranc has gone to the front there just for a few yards, and he's already looking around and getting Pantani to, to welcome through. We saw Pantani's team directed right they're coming through, but he's probably saying to him was, don't do all the work, let Baranc do some of the work. Baranc will have no sympathy at you, and the finish and of course we, we, we all know that Pontani and Vianca are something similar in time trials so they're probably going for second or third place on the podium in Paris so don't bring him along with you now to the finish let him work a little bit and there we have the yellow jersey and it looks like that one of his teammates had caught up with him at the moment or is he going straight past he is looking back looks I think like, it is Simon, like is it? Simon yeah. Yeah. five kilometers then through the tunnel goes uh, Ulrich a very cold part it is to be plunged into this but he won't take him long to come out Ali Yag 
Yeah, it says. Well, Jalibert tried to get away on the climb up towards the uh, port uh, as and Valera, but uh, sorry, off the top of that and uh, got caught, and that was it. So, in fact, he's way out of contention at the moment. Jalibert having another bad day in the Tour de France. So, the Hank and Pantani are on it on 35 seconds down on Ulrich at the moment with five kilometers to go. They may not be able to come back, but still, they're limiting at the moment. This could be the podium in Paris then as well, Dave. Even though we know we have the Alps still to come, these riders are the best in the Tour at the moment. Although I think that Orlando and Rees will still have something up their sleeve. The time time to the two the, the Orlando and Rees, we must, must forget, they can punch. I mean, look at look at Indrain. Indrain should ride with the mountain climbers. Come the time trial, he'd knock two, three, four, five minutes out of them, wouldn't he? And, both, and, and Rees, don't forget, in the Tour de France, but it went from Huy to Sarang, what was that, about three years ago. He, he finished within about five seconds. Uh, of, uh, of uh, Indraim and it, it actually was up on him with a few kilometres to go and look at that as a sight <laughs> The climb up to the finish at the ski station of uh, Arcalis. The crowd out in their thousands as ever. They've been uh, lining the road since the crack of dawn this morning. Someone came up last night as well. Spell of thought, by the way, as we're watching the uh, victor come up here. We think it could be the victor. Uh, they come in toward the finishing area, and you'll see all the uh, uh, all the paraphernalia of the Tour de France. Just spell of thought because last night, after we finished the stage, all the big vehicles had to drive something like uh, the, the 252 kilometres either lads have had to race and when you drive that far up these roads in a big truck you can be spending something like six to eight hours driving the truck then when you get there through the night you spend time erecting all the banners erecting all the uh, uh, rostrums the tribunes and so on a tremendous job by those people So these two, Veronk and Pantani, still about 35 seconds down, coming up into the final, what we've about just over. He's gone away, it sounds like 50 seconds is the lead now for... Uh, no, 50 seconds end for the lead. Reese is now two minutes behind Ulrich who's up there so really these two are fighting for second and third spot well I got Pantani down to win today but uh, there we are four kilometers to go Ulrich is in the lead by some 50 seconds as he heads up towards the finish right up there in the distance and I did like to put in that mention then Stephen because you've driven the course today I drove last night and my mind went out to these chaps who drive these big wagons they're asleep now in the front of their cabs because that's what they have to do to get some sleep to drive on through and these chaps who never see the race really they're building the structures we're sitting in now they're putting up all the barriers, all the barricades in very difficult circumstances laying down all the cables getting all the TV lines connected together getting all the big trucks in position getting the satellites beamed up in the sky so you people back in uh, Great Britain back across Europe can watch live on Eurosport a race which started at 9 30 this morning we're coming up towards uh, half past 5 8 hours live television and my hat goes off to the hard workers who've made it possible through working through the night that we can have the system today to speak to you out there. I think we, we have a big round of applause, Stephen. Well done, Dave. Well done, well done, well done. It's very true. We, when we arrive here on our commentary podium every day, we kind of feel, well, OK, there must be one of these podiums every in every stage finish. But in reality, no, they are, they've been put up over, taken down and put up again in a different spot overnight. So uh, fair play to you guys who um, do are responsible for all these uh, technical and um, uh, construction uh, work here to finish every day. Well, at least as far as I'm concerned, back in Andorra tonight, the first time I, since Rouen I've, I've slept in the same bed two nights running. I don't mean to say I've been sleeping in somebody else's bed, but we've been moving night after night after night, and now we actually will be in Andorra tonight, the great supermarket of the world, as Pantani starts to accelerate, but can Bronk hold him? They're really fighting with second and third spot at the moment. Ulrich is still going, and he's over one minute uh, uh, in the lead with four kilometers to go, so they really are fighting out for second and third spot now. We have Orlando and Riz Diffo back two minutes and ten seconds from uh, from Ulrich. So that means the Pontani and Vyohanka are one minute and ten seconds ahead of uh, Riz, Orlando and Diffo at the moment. 
Stephen, we saw Pantani delayed in those crashes. The poor chap kept getting blocked early on. Just what would be the situation? Just think about it if he hadn't lost all that time. Because as of the day before yesterday, he was 7 minutes and 17 seconds down on the leader. Pantani's got enormous skill, but unfortunately he was in the wrong place at the wrong time when those crashes came. Otherwise, we could be looking at a different set of circumstances. But don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, we're on tomorrow again in the uh, Pyrenees. It's a flat run in towards Perpignan once they go over the climb. So I don't think Pantani do very much tomorrow but we've got the outdoors as well and you know Stephen tell the ladies and gentlemen how much time you can lose or gain on that one well I know from personal experience I once lost one minute and four seconds to Pedro Delgado in 87 when I won the tour but I lost 22 minutes on the front group and upward ways in 1983 when uh, Laurent Finian won the Tour de France. So it's amazing the amount of time you can lose if you're on a bad day. So the Tour de France is not over yet by any means, although we looked and thought that today would be the big one that was sought out for the yellow jersey. And we hope you'll stay with us on Eurosport for the rest of the, what, another 12 days yet to come to see more exciting racing like this. We're back on there again tomorrow on the stage at Perpignan and then we have the rest day at Santa at the end when we come back then with the time trial. Three kilometres to go of today, but certainly we've seen young Jan Ulrich uh, at long last be given his head. He's gone away, he's left the, uh, the specialist climbers who I thought would triumph today. I thought people like uh, Jimenez and Pantani and Escarti would have been here at the end of the stage, but uh, Ulrich's shown that he has a skill and the ability to go away to ride to victory on this stage 10. Inside the final three kilometres there at the moment, and these two are looking for second and third place. Jan Ulrich gone way down the road, well over one minute in the lead. He'll get the stage victory and the yellow jersey. Pantani there, leading Rock at the moment. They seem to be working, but only just enough to stay away for second and third place, Stephen. Yes, listening to the race radio here, you have uh, uh, Reese and uh, Diffo uh, dropping the group now behind here, uh, the group Orlando. So Reese uh, seems to be getting a second kind of a... Uh, second kind of form here and they're uh, trying to limit as well because Reese like it's not yet out of this race uh, altogether yet because there are still two big time trials to come and we all know Reese is a very good time trialist compared to the likes of Bjorhank and Pontani so he's one minute down behind Pontani at the moment and Bjorhank so one minute in a time trial is nothing for Reese so I think that uh, Bjorhank and Pontani are still not happy should, should still not be happy to be out of the, the storm with one minute in hand and here we look again at the slow motion from that uh, main group here when Reese just went back to them, looked at them and rode away. We've seen it done before, but he was quickly marked then and uh, he's got to do all the work now and tie up yet another Festina up in towards the finish area. Festina undoubtedly going in towards the team prize yet again as Dufo marked uh, Reese on that ride up. But uh, there's no doubt about it, this young man Ulrich uh, coming up this climb. You, you, you Doesn't seem to be getting any weaker at all, Dave. He's flying up the cell. Uh, two minutes of 40 seconds back to Reese and Dufa at the moment, and wedged in between them are uh, the. Uh, Reese has gone there. Do some. He's gone away. So 2:52 back to Alano, and Reese has now left Dufo. Reese seems to recover suddenly, doesn't he? Yeah, I think he actually took that drink on the, 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 the climb there a few minutes ago. He took it at the right time. He was having a bad patch, and he's just, just been able to kind of recover uh, over the last few kilometres. So it's not all over yet for Bjorn Rees, and what a fight he's putting up to get back again. Over the years, we watched Indrain dominate the race, and then Rees ripped him apart last year in the Tour de France. He wasn't quite on form coming into this race with Bjorn Rees, and his young protégé here has been given his head to go away. He's 1 minute 15 seconds ahead of Veronk and Pantani, and something like over 2 minutes ahead of Bjorn Rees at the moment. I just hope he keeps something on his legs for tomorrow, Dave, because tomorrow's stage into Perpignan starts off right on a, on a climb which goes, up to a, which goes on for 25 kilometres at the start. So. I think that may only be for the King of the Mountains competition, don't you? Because the way it runs down all the way into Perpignan tomorrow, uh, it may come back together oh, again. Oh, really? Yeah. It'll definitely come back, but if you have bad legs, you're going to suffer a lot tomorrow morning. Eh? Well, everybody will suffer tomorrow, I think, anyway. Yes, because a lot of riders are further down the course as he comes up towards one kilometre to go. Uh, Chris Borman, by the way, crashed yesterday, as you may know, and uh, stretched his neck or ricked his neck a little bit. And Chris was uh, dropped off uh, quite early on, round about the Col de Port, about halfway point, and he was struggling a bit then. But Chris said he was going to soldier on. He definitely wants to ride uh, in the time trials. He wants to get to Paris. So we wish him the best of luck. And it was just unfortunate that he had that misfortune to crash a, a couple of days ago, uh, crash yesterday. Uh, 
at a time when the pressure was really on. So uh, Ulrich Doe kept out of trouble. He's always been near or near the front. He's done a lot of work with the telecom squad in chasing down the brakes early on. He's been a domestic to Reese, but now he's riding in to a triumphant finish. He's really giving it everything here with Sam going up a gear. He knows that when he crossed the line here, contrary to yesterday, when he crossed the line here, the stopwatch will stop. And every second that he puts into the guys behind him, whether it be behind, whether it be Pontani, whether it be his teammate Bjorn Rees, is a second well earned. Well, here he comes in. He took a stage in the Tour of Switzerland when he got stage four. That was a one with a big, bad climb at the end of it. He was second on stage nine in the Tour of Switzerland this year when he went on to finish third overall. He didn't look like he was quite in form in the Tour of Switzerland. He was there or thereabouts. In fact, on one day, Reese rode with him and then rode away from him because he couldn't hold the pace. And, in fact, Agnelotto was able to hang on to Reese. But he's obviously timed his return to form absolutely perfectly. He won the German Championship uh, on Sunday week. And now he's riding in the... the uh, Jersey, uh, the championship of Germany. There's a, there's a wry smile on the face of uh, my German colleagues here. They're going to be quite happy. I wonder if they're going to buy the champagne tonight for young Jan Ulrich. What a tremendous talent. The man who was the amateur champion of the world in 1993 finished second in the Tour de France uh, last year when he won also the time trial stage. He's coming in confidently to ride through. He doesn't look like he's covered 155 miles, 252 kilometres on what turned out to be a damp and dismal start today. Over the top of the Col d'Azale, the Col de Port de Aspe, the Col de Port, the Port d'Olive, the Col de Ordino, over two second category climbs, sorry, three second category climbs, one third, one first, and now a whole category climb, and he's been out there riding his bike for nearly eight hours since we start this morning in Luchon, and he's riding himself into the history books and into the yellow jersey. We'll have to go back and find when the last German was to do that. And there you are at 32 kilometers per hour. That's 25 miles an hour. He wins the stage and takes the yellow jerseys. Pantani comes up with Veronk on his wheel. Here you have another race going on here. You have Vihank uh, trying to limit and trying to kind of get or get close to having a second place on GC. And you have Pantani coming up trying to get place for the third place because he is far, far further back than Pantani uh, Vihank on GC. So Pantani, who moved up to 15th on GC, 4 minutes 34 seconds down on uh, uh, Vassar this morning. He'll still be something like about 5 minutes down on uh, all the good takes the yellow jersey. For Rump this morning, starting 5th spot, uh, 1 minute 43 seconds down, 1.30 on Ulrich. So he's still going to be over 2 minutes down, maybe 2.5 minutes on Ulrich. But Pantani is moving remorselessly up the general classification and could find himself up there in the top half dozen. A superb ride by this specialist climber from Italy. Marco Pantani now trying to get that second spot, but on his wheel, you can see Veron can actually punch his way past, but no, he doesn't get it. It goes to Pantani in second spot. Veron takes third. The Casagrande now coming in after putting in a great ride as well. I wouldn't have put him up there so far this morning to start, Dave. It'll be interesting to see now how much time Reese will have lost. That was a good ride by Casagrande too. We haven't seen much of him, he's just done his own thing, he wasn't coming up uh, much on the uh, public address, uh, sorry, on the, on the race radio, he's just been nicely riding in, a lot of people tip this chap as a very good future uh, champion in, in Italy, and it consistently they believe that he'll come good and maybe one day win the Tour of Italy, he's certainly shown great courage throughout the uh, Tour de France, when Psycho have not been one of the strongest teams, they came in here very much to support uh, the performances of Gotti, who rides to Psycho, who won the Tour of Italy this year, but uh, now taking his place, Casagrande is looking good and a sterling performance though by Bjorn Rees today. Eh? Yeah, a great effort here today, but uh, we have here now Bjorn will be in second place on general classification behind uh, Ulrich at 2.37. We see Rees here, he's suffering it, he hasn't, hasn't had a very easy day today, but uh, even on the big chain ring here, Dave, on the big chain ring. It does wind him, doesn't it? Even though he may be kind of a little bit dehydrated and what have you. As Laurent Diffo goes back, Dave, uh, Dufo was with him when he moved, made the first move, but I don't think he's going to catch him before the line at the moment. Well, the wrist's on the big ring now, and the, ter the, the road gets a little bit flatter, so um, uh, he may not catch him, but he's definitely not going to finish far behind him.
good end of the day but at the end of this tour it's just kind of looking 10 days down the road it could be a 1-2 with Ulrich first and Ria second the, the change of last year but uh, I'm going on about it anyway but the, the, the tour is a long way from being over yet it still has the the, uh, the Alps to come there's still two major time trials and of course 10 days of, uh, of racing to come 15 Well, here they come with the specialist climber Escarton in this group together with Gemini's. I thought these two would finish a lot higher up, and Alano's in. So the three Spanish riders coming up here, Jimenez. Uh, together with Skartin and Alano and they're 3 minutes 44 seconds down on uh, the German rider Ulrich who's come across to win the stage and take the yellow jersey Luchtenberger another specialist climber coming in at uh, 3.55 Stephen I've been looking back in the record books and I seem to think it might have been Didi Turo that was the last German to wear the yellow jersey in the Tour de France I'm, I, I can't uh, really pick up on uh, anybody Goltz, else Goltz, 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 was, it, was he after Turo? Goltz got it? Uh, no Goltz got it after Turo I think did he? right ok well, I'll check that one up then but certainly Turo was, was very prominent in the yellow jersey in the days uh, when he was racing way back in the in the late 70s so yes you're probably right about uh, about golfs but uh, it's a, a long long time back now there's Luca now arriving at the moment after doing a very, very, uh, he's doing an enormous amount of work for Bjornhank uh, all day and all day yesterday. Here he is now riding in himself as Bietzberg uh, goes for the sprint. And that looks like Kamersin, who at one time looked good in the race, blue, then got back again. So what a story they'll all have to tell today about the, the way in which they were going. Well, there comes Dario. Look how much time he lost in that uh, final one. Uh, Ten kilometres, nearly five minutes down. Just show you how much time you can lose. Well, I thought actually when they caught him, he might have lost a lot more, but he's uh, obviously just kind of got into his own kind of rhythm and kept it there all the way up. Uh. Well, there we are. What an eventful day in the Tour de France. There's still stacks of riders way down the mountain coming in on this stage, which lasted nearly eight hours as into the finishing straight. An action replay of Ulrich completing the distance in seven hours, 46 minutes and seven seconds. Jan Ulrich stamps his authority on the race, and as Virank and Pantani went over the line, they may have realized they were now fighting for second place in Paris a week on Sunday. Such was the German superiority. Ulrich wins by a minute and eight seconds from Pantani and Virank, Casagrande in a fine fourth. Reese fifth, Abraham Alano came in in ninth place. Ulrich said it had been a shame on Monday when he missed out on the yellow jersey by 13 seconds. Teammate Bjarne Bjarne Rees had told him he should attack on Tuesday. Ulrich said there may be surprises in the Alps, but for the moment he's happy with the yellow jersey on his back for at least one stage. Ulrich with a considerable lead over Virang, Olano, Rees and Pantani. He may well increase it in Friday's mountain time trial. Britain's Chris Boardman's 94th over an hour behind the leaders. Wednesday's stage takes them to Perpignan. You can see it live on Eurosport. It starts at 1.30 in the UK. The Tour de France was brought to you by... Lika Pilsner.